Welcome to the Saving Stormwater Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Compliance Go, a cloud-based stormwater inspection platform for stormwater professionals. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Lori Murphy. Lori, um, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do and how you're saving stormwater. Oh, hi, Preston. Thanks for having me on today. Uh, and for those of you who are listening, my name is Lori Murphy, and I am the president of National NPDES Solutions. And we like to try to find solutions to stormwater management, either uh, through training, consulting, developing uh, plans of action uh, to help reduce illicit discharges uh, to either your municipal permit, industrial permit, or your um, general contractor permit. Phenomenal. And that, that leads right into today's theme. So today we're going to be discussing a little bit about the letter of stormwater law. Uh, Lori and I, were going to be talking about some of the important aspects of stormwater management. Uh, we're also going to address some of those common questions that uh, new MS4s or maybe even existing MS4s have. Um, in terms of managing their MS4, their permit, and some of the tips and tricks of the industry. So one of those defining issues for MS4s, and um, this is kind of common around the entire United States, is that back and forth tension between city inspectors and their general contractors. So Lori, we wanted to have you on because my understanding is you've had a little bit of experience with addressing these issues and, you know, maybe there have been some unique responses that you've found across the states. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think a lot of us in the industry can come up with one or two key points uh, or problems uh, between the relationship because you're looking at two different entities. First, you have the municipal government and they either have local ordinances or they have a specific way to review the site inspections. And then you have the general contractor who has to file for a separate permit uh, through the state or the EPA um, that qualifies them to be able to produce some type of development uh, in that particular um, city or county government. And when you have the two of them together, it tends to be more of a like a rushed situation uh, because the EPA states that a developer only needs about 48 hour notice before they put the shovel in the ground. But then you have to look at the local ordinances so the contractor has to say, well, wait a minute, I might only need a, a two day notice. Uh, that's a minimum requirement. But then possibility of a particular city might state, well, we have a local ordinance that kind of supersedes that and says, you're going to have to come in uh, and sit down with your stormwater pollution prevention plan, your tree and landscape plan. I have to go out to the site and make sure that your erosion and sediment controls are going to be effective for this type of a development. And then on top of that, they may have a public requirement where they have to go uh, to a like a town hall meeting where the public is invited to question or make comments on the type of development. It just depends. So depending on what the city has to do and uh, based on the qualifications of the development and the permit that the developer has, it can be quite a very difficult process. And I find that I think the uh, lack of communication between the two of them and the procurement processes for the local government on their own developments tend to create the biggest friction. Um, for example, in the procurement uh, eyes, it, they basically make this statement such as this. We are going to choose the most responsible, uh, least expensive developer. And, and unfortunately, what that means is whoever has the lowest bidder is going to get the job because there's always that uh, situation up front when they put out the RFP that states this is how you become the most responsible and then of all of those people whoever the lowest bidder is is going to get the job and they tend to cut corners and the government ends up having problems later on because they may not have the right controls on site 
and it was not what they originally um, agreed upon. Sure. So I kind of a follow up question to that. Are, how often do those stars kind of align in <laughs> in a in a perfect way for a stormwater manager? Is it does it happen at all? I mean, my assumption would be that it doesn't really happen. It doesn't really happen. Sometimes it'll happen on the front end and everything seems to be fine until they re the municipality receives phone calls and complaints uh, due to uh, either track out conditions or some type of uh, violations on site uh, that are affecting adjacent property owners, for example. And somehow the communication uh, became distorted there was a disconnect where the site reviewer or the engineer at the municipal level says, make sure that your inspections are done on time. I even want you to copy me on the inspections once a week. And if you have uh, rain, you know, and you have to inspect within 24 hours half of a half an inch of rain, I would like you to copy me on that. And sometimes the municipality uses that as a babysitter just because the inspection was done doesn't mean that the silt fence was replaced, for example, or that it was even put in correctly. And so then you have a problem on the back end and the municipal government becomes very reactive. What are we going to do now to get compliance? Because now we have a big mess. Sure. So I, I guess that seems like kind of the perfect storm of a lot of things that can happen all at once. Um, is there, you know, maybe sometimes situations where a stormwater manager or an inspector or somebody at the city might get in their own way? You know, sometimes I've, you know, I tend to talk a little bit too much when I'm trying to interact with somebody and communicate. And sometimes I end up stepping on my own feet. Is that something that you've, you know, is that a situation you've heard of before? Or is there situations where a stormwater manager is kind of creating a harder situation than it needs to be? Well, it depends. If you're talking about the site inspector for construction, construction, that's one specific situation because it's usually a time constraint. Right. Uh, as you know, construction permits are uh, they they come frequent and often, and they come and go. Notices of termination, and then another notice of intent comes. Another notice of termination. You might have one guy in the office. When it comes to stormwater management, for example, the stormwater coordinator or the manager uh, that is, is supposed to implement the plan um, tends to be overwhelmed for a lot of reasons, either financially because they don't have a stormwater utility to really run the program effectively and they don't have enough staff or equipment to do the program right. Um, sometimes it can be that they don't utilize enough resources outside of their municipality to help with their compliance objectives, like utilizing citizens, for example, uh, developing a task force for the municipal government to help identify problems in getting citizens engaged uh, in the process of removing and identifying illicit discharges. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of not having the equipment and you can get a memorandum of understanding with other municipalities and kind of share resources. I um, know that the EPA and the state agencies tend to have a very large to-do list when it comes to the six minimum control measures and making sure you're compliant with the objectives, which is reducing your uh, pollutants to the maximum extent practicable. And that can be very overwhelming for a stormwater manager to try to say, how am I going to do that under the effluent guidelines from the EPA uh, to the maximum extent practicable and using the best technology economically available, for example. And I think that stormwater managers are like, well, I just, I'm just going to do what I can do and I can't handle any more than that. Uh, and I think they tend to forget about utilizing other non-conventional means to, to get help to achieve their goals. I gotcha. So in these rough situations, you know, these stormwater managers, they're a bit overwhelmed. Maybe they're a bit underfunded. You know, maybe your situation is just a little bit difficult. Lori, what are some of the, you know, maybe solutions that you found or maybe some unique stories that have um, found success across the United States? 
Well, sure, I can give you one local story uh, that's been very successful. Uh, it's under a phase one program, which of course, course works on a lot of narrative controls, uh, structural and non-structural controls, and water quality uh, based on TMDL reports. And they have four um, different permittees that have an interlocal agreement here, which is quite interesting because you don't normally have four. You'll see a lot, uh, two municipalities, like a phase one and a smaller phase two will jump on and piggyback onto another phase one. But in this situation, we have the city, the county, the Department of Transportation, and another very small city that probably has about 2,500 in there, but they do have impaired water bodies. So they're required to be permitted because of that, even though they don't meet the minimum qualifications of 1,000 uh, residents per square mile under uh, the Phase Two program. And so what they did to try to achieve uh, better water quality based on the water uses in our area is we set up a certified stormwater volunteer program. And we acquired um, some office space or church space and trained citizens on how to report illicit discharges. The city decided to develop a 311 app because when you get a lot of millennials and young people, they like to use their mobile devices. So we wanted to make it easy for them. And they were able to quantify this under the remand rule to be clear, specific, and measurable to report these discharges by just taking a photograph, uploading it to the app, along with the location and a short description. And then they went to a centralized spreadsheet uh, and after a period of time, it was the public works department was able to receive these uh, uh, reports usually within one hour, and they would respond within 24 hours uh, to reduce that discharge and not allow it to continue on for extended periods of time, increasing those water quality uh, results to improve um, uh, over time. And so over the last three or four years, they have improved over 32%. Uh, overall as far as an improvement. So that goes to show that sometimes you got to get a little creative and look at resources that won't cost you anything or any time or money uh, that can help you meet a goal or two. And But it starts off with finding out what your problem is in your municipality first. Is it illegal dumping? Is it yard waste? Is it restaurants and commercial activity that are creating the problem? Uh, is it that you don't have a stormwater utility? Do we need to sell the public on how we need a stormwater utility? How do we get the buy-in from the public and public officials? So it starts with finding out what your pain is first and then coming up with a solution uh, to do that that you can afford uh, with time and money to do that process. Right. I, I love what you said there about finding your pain and kind of that whole process of identifying where your real issues lie so that you know where to start, right? I think that's kind of a common thing that stormwater managers run into is not even knowing where to start, right? It, it's kind of like you said, you know, there's a lot of things, there's six minimum control measurement, or is it measurements? Measures. Measures, measures, right. Right. And one of those minimum control measures is training, right? And every city grapples with that issue of who needs to be trained, how much training do they need, what, you know, what applies as the, you know, to the highest extent possible. Could you speak a little bit to that? Like, what are some of those answers you found in your experience? Oh, absolutely. And I teach in many different states, and some are state regulated and have a state program, including Idaho was the most recent state to jump on board and try to untie the apron strings with the EPA. But I also go to states such as New Hampshire and Massachusetts and Washington, D.C., which are EPA regulated. And most folks have a misunderstanding that a state is always going to have a stricter permit than the EPA because the states have the option of doing such things. But in, in the other hand, uh, I, will, I have found in the past that the EPA regulated permits are more strict 
and require and mandate not only training with the public works departments, but they also require so many hours of training for staff members, public officials, and residents, and that those hours must be uh, written in on their annual report what the training was, who attended, and what it was about. And you have to have so much of that every year. And I find that any permit that encourages or mandates training is always going to be a permit that's going to be uh, a well-educated and a well-rounded permit because everybody from the person who answers the phone at your municipality all the way to the mayor or the, the township uh, city official needs to understand NPDES uh, because it is a community problem that's going to take a community to resolve it. And training is probably one of the most important ways to continue to update the changes in the laws the changes in regulations, changes in the ordinances, so that you can be on top of how to effectively run your stormwater management plan. Sure. So with stormwater managers that are a little bit, I guess, maybe strung out isn't quite the right phrase, but you know they have a lot of things that they need to get done within a very short period of time with a very limited budget. What does it mean to you to you know, get the right training from everybody who answers the phone to the mayor? Is is that kind of a diversified training that you do on an individual basis? Is there kind of a way to do a one-stop shop for it all? What What are your thoughts? That's a great question. Uh, and for everyone listening out there, I want them to be very, to consider uh, the type of training that each person would need. You certainly do not want to inundate public officials with the day-to-day -day, uh, legal operations uh, that are required, like, for example, uh, the clean-outs of stormwater inlets and vacuum trucks and street sweeping and things like that, that we may go more into detail uh, for code enforcement or public works officials or engineers when developing their plan, because it's always about that plan. There's a lot of engineering methods that go into that. So when you're talking about public officials, for example, what motivates them? Well, they want to stay in office. What else motivates them? They don't want their constituents constantly calling them and nagging them about problems. They want to solve problems. They want everybody to be happy. So what is it that a public official needs to know compared to, say, a public works director? Well, a lot. And when it comes to uh, flood mitigation, for example, that is important. When it comes to fines, uh, public officials want sexy projects, especially in an election year. They'll be the first one to go to the mayor or official and ask for money from the budget, which is why there are public uh, budget workshops every year uh, that are open to the public. And they're looking to take public works money or any money they can get from any department, even if they have to skim you know, uh, $5,000 here and $10,000 there. But what they don't realize is that that money was already delegated to go for a specific cause, either retrofits that we might need, new baffle boxes, uh, maybe stormwater pond repair and uh, maintenance uh, and things like that. And so public officials need to get the buy-in to the importance of, number one, having a stormwater utility because they're the ones that are going to vote on it. Number two, to leave the budget alone uh, because that is something that uh, public works officials and engineers need desperately to run their program, and it shouldn't be skimmed off the top. Uh, and that, you know, maybe local option sales taxes and ad valorem taxes should be designated like maybe 1% out of those budgets to go into the stormwater utility just to help out. And they need to understand what the legal ramifications are if they don't meet the compliance of their permit. For example, the fines of up to $55,000 a day. Uh, a lot of municipalities couldn't be, uh, they'd be bankrupt in a month at that rate. And what the public works uh, department is up against to maintain compliance to avoid consent orders and avoiding these fines. Uh, and that doesn't look good. It's bad public press. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when it comes to 
the NPDES permit, have there been any, I guess, misunderstandings that you've run into in terms of the terminology? Um, the, you know, the permit is, it is a legal document. You know, that's kind of our, our theme today is the letter of stormwater law. What are some of the common misconceptions that you've run into in terms of what the NPDES permit really does require and needs from you? Well, there are a lot of misconceptions uh, to the vague language in your permit requirements. Most of the time when I'm working with municipalities or industrial permittees, they're looking at the, the easy things, the low-hanging fruit, things that they know that they can do. And they look at it from that perspective. Why? Well, if you're the stormwater manager and you have an agenda, you know you can't do everything all the time. And there's going to be an illicit discharge at any given day, at any given time, on any given street. So they look for the low-hanging fruit so that they can have something in their annual report so they can say that they're knocking things out. But the misconceptions that they have is not really understanding parts of the vague language that's in there that doesn't talk about the six minimum controls. For example, effluent guidelines and effluent limitations. The language basically states that um, if you don't, you know, they think that if I don't have the money for it, I don't need to worry about providing for it in the permit because I can't do it. It's impossible. And so they overlook those things. And the effluent guidelines refer to things such as the best available technology economically achievable, for example. What in the world does that mean? And I get those deer in the headlight eyes. I first heard that. I says, is this just some crazy stuff that the EPA decided to throw in there just so that we could rip our hair out? Oh, this boy. is crazy. What exactly does that mean? Well, Preston, basically that vague language in the effluent guidelines that refer to industrial facilities and C&D refers to if I'm an EPA inspector or I'm a state inspector, whatever equipment I feel is the best to be used on this site is what I will determine what will be used on this site. It has nothing to do with the stormwater manager or coordinator or anyone running the program to decide that. So we might say, hey, you know, we've got our baffle boxes up and we've got our retrofits going on. We have the best equipment that we can afford. Nope, that is not what the EPA says. The EPA mm -hmm. says, I can come out to your site and say, this is not the best available technology economically achievable which means that I want you to, to change it out. And there you go. I gotcha. Um, so would you, I, I feel like a lot of this kind of revolves around stormwater education, right? A lot of this comes down to how much do you know about stormwater? How much does your city know about stormwater? Um, and in my experience, stormwater education isn't really a one-time thing. It's kind of a continuing experience. Would, would you agree with me on that? Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, right now, um, you know, we have an office that believes in deregulation. What does that actually mean? Well, that means that we're not getting rid of the EPA, but we want to give those, that regulation, uh, those regulation requirements back to the state. We want them to determine what they think is best because we don't want to babysit anymore. We don't want to get involved in the process. But people get confused thinking that we are deregulating. So they get a mindset of thinking, oh, well, we don't have to worry about being compliant with our permit anymore because our office basically is saying that we want the states to uh, be in charge. We're deregulating. And so they have this preconceived notion that that means we can be lax now. That's ah, okay. Nobody's really checking in on us. We're not going to get audited. That's not to worry. And so that changes. Uh, the changes in the WOTUS rules, okay, Waters of the United States. 
Now the Trump administration and the EPA are handing that over to the states. Well, the states are appealing that right now. So right now we're in limbo. So you have to be educated to kind of find out when something new comes out on the federal register, how does that apply to my permit? Because now that's going to be added. And if you only go to a one-stop shop or a training one time, you're going to miss out on the numerous regulations that happen in these processes over and over every year. So I think that's very important that it's kind of like being a teacher uh, or any other professional type of uh, job where there are oversight regulations and you've got to be updated on those all the time or you're going to lose out and you're going to miss out um, on some of the compliance measures that uh, may create a problem down the road for a municipality, for example. I see. Um, so kind of elaborating on that train of thought there, what are some misconceptions that you typically run into about the, about the permit and the NPDES requirements? The biggest misconception is kind of wrapped up in a nutshell of what I've kind of said already to this point is no one's watching. We're going to work on the low hanging fruit. There's no way we can do all of this. Um, uh, you know, we're going to do what we can do and, and that's it. And, uh, I think that's the misconception, but there is a solution to every problem, whether you have money or not. Uh, and there's a little bit of a back pocket partner there that even though the EPA might say you have to do every, you have to reduce pollutant to the maximum extent practicable and use the best technology economically achievable. As long as you are moving forward and applying standards to improve water quality, then they'll kind of give you a little bit of a leeway. Okay. But that does not mean that you will not be randomly audited because it really happens. I've had a client just recently get randomly audited. They've been a permittee for seven years and they had three people uh, from the state come out in one EPA inspector and they were only uh, given a 24 hour notice. That was it. And they came out and they wanted to check the six minimum control measures and whether there were a variety of things being utilized for public education and, and public participation and active and post construction controls and the pollution prevention and illicit discharge detection and elimination and they were not prepared. So these are some things that you just need to be aware of and always try to be a step ahead, get educated, get, have consultants come out and help you, get training. Trainings are available all over. There's all kinds of companies that train. Get the right type of education and training that you need to be on top of this and to find out what your pain is so that we can help assess what you need to have a better permit. Oh, Lori, I feel like I could talk to you forever. You've got a lot of awesome views and insider knowledge about stormwater and, you know, kind of the industry as it stands. Um, and God, we've only hit, you know, I'd say half of the questions that I wanted to ask you, but we're starting to kind of hit our time limit here. We've got a couple of minutes before we're uh, going to cut off, but I did want to ask you, I try and give the last the last little bit of the podcast to you. What is, what's, you know, if we had a listener here today that's listening, what's the one thing that you would like them to take away from this podcast episode? That is a great question. I want them to know that there is a solution to every problem that they have. I, uh, and that not to give up and not to be frustrated, uh, to please reach out to other municipalities, reach out to a P2 assistance center uh, that can give you some help on some of your uh, pollution prevention techniques. Reach out to other professionals or consultants or trainings to help you manage solving some of those problems because they are achievable even in light of the EPA and state uh, regulations. Phenomenal. Okay, well, that uh, that brings us to the end of the podcast. Lori, thanks you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd love to do another podcast because, like I said, I think we've only scratched the surface so far. Oh, yes, I'd love to do more podcasts. And uh, 
you know, please reach out for those listeners uh, to, and get the help that you need and, and don't feel that you're alone in this. And, you know, we, you can achieve anything uh, with a community and just the right direction. So I'm looking forward to doing more with you. We can go into even more details and more suggestions. I'm looking forward to that. Absolutely. Where's the, uh, where's the best place for people to find you and get in contact with you if they have questions or, you know, just want to pick your brain? All right. The best way to get a hold of me is to go to my website. It has all of my telephone information and my physical address. And you can go to www.survivenpdes.com. I love that website. I'll make sure to link it on the, uh, at the podcast description, just right below the video. Um, also just wanted to throw something in there from compliance go. They are helping us make sure that this podcast stays alive and they're keeping us running, which, you know, I can't appreciate enough. Um, there have been a few issues that we've talked about that compliance go is uniquely equipped to solve. Uh, we'll be uh, linking their website down below. Make sure to check them out as well. All right. Thank you so much, Lori. This was a great episode and I look forward to more episodes with you. Absolutely.